we really appreciate the opportunity of being here in Pittsburgh and for what the Federation has done to bring us here. And we appreciate the opportunity and we'd love to hear your feedback about the stories that we're going to share today. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Um, we're going to present three stories about creating connected communities of care. Because really what we found out uh, is that, and what you all know, is that with all, if we just look at healthcare, quote, healthcare alone, all the different people involved in healthcare, whether it's your radiologist, your primary care physician, a nurse, a son, a daughter, uh, the, the formal and informal parts of the caregivers are really disconnected. In the past two years, there was an article in New England Journal of Medicine which looked at all the, tr all the information flows that tried to occur, the context that tried to occur, and they actually had a, a, a dynamic graph of constantly these t calls and interrupted calls and disconnected calls that, and things that didn't happen and return calls, and we're trying to smooth all that to happen to create, to go from a disconnected and inefficient uh, community of care to a connected community of care. And we'll try to describe what we're doing uh, with that, and I'll just have Neeraj give a brief summary of just who we are and what we're doing. Thanks, Mike, and thanks everyone again for, for having us here today. Um, you know, as Mike said, this came out of the result of seeing a very disconnected and inefficient um, uh, care environment, and it was actually born out of the experiences of our CEO who was dealing with a, a family friend uh, afflicted with brain cancer, and um, the and our CEO as well as a number of family members are trying to understand and um, you know, what's the best care plan what can I do what are the different who are the different elements um, the people involved the PCP the oncologist family members um, social services and it was you know it was, frankly it was a mess and you know as we move to value-based care models you can just imagine the the problem on the other side where you know you're gonna have 80 percent of reimbursements uh, tied to some level of patient engagement or, or um, outcomes by, uh, by 2020, according to CMS. So how do you make that work in, um, you know, you, you can't make it work with the current model, which really thinks that faxes and spreadsheets and post-it notes are, are 21st century technology. And our estimates are that um, it can cost upwards of $5,000 per patient per year to have a care management program, um, you know, with the current model. Um, the Economist estimated $30 billion a year is wasted uh, from uncoordinated care. So that was the that was the genesis of Care Navigator. Blueprint was formed uh, in 2003 as a healthcare technology consulting firm, um, and this product was sort of a, a vision in the in the eye of the CEO. Um, in 2012, we launched at late 2014. Uh, we have now about 150,000 contracted lives. Our our you know our core uh, customers are really uh, health systems, accountable care organizations. Uh, we've had conversations with payers uh, as well, and Mike's going to go through some of the uh, some of the use cases to give you a little bit of a flavor around you know, how organizations are using Care Navigator in different settings. So we're going to describe three stories today. One, a patient-centered medical home, children's specialized hospital in New Jersey that deals with complex patients and a, have a particular program with. Uh, autism patients. Two, uh, the, one of the leading statewide ACOs, which is uh, One Care Vermont, which we just started implementing in the past uh, month and a half. And third, some experiences we have, uh, we're going to start implementation shortly in a New York State district program uh, focused on the medical home, which they feel is the critical component of what they need to do to build an integrated delivery system. And we're going to give you a flavor of what those were. To set context, the, what our approach has been is a platform approach to care management. So whether you're on, your, whether people are on a desktop, uh, mobile, mobile platforms, iPads, mm. or desktops, or a physician looking at their EMR can have an app uh, right next door on the screen describe, uh, that uh, brings them Care Navigator. So what we're trying to do is connect the inside in a hospital setting to the outside world, whether it's EMRs and HIEs, POP, analy POP and health analytics or claims management, 
how does that intersect with the population? There's lots of information being stored, but what activates that information? And Care Navigator is the connector uh, to connect to physicians, patients, family caregivers, and different uh, modes of and channels, which we'll give you an example of. And basically, it's built just to get an idea. How does this work? It's a hub and spoke model. The CRM uh, is the hub, which has all this information as a principal source that a care coordinator, care case manager might use, that connects at the same time to mobile apps, Windows desktop apps, Microsoft Outlook, physician desktop ribbon, and uh, upcoming website as well. So that's just the structure. Anything that's in one place appears in all the places at the same time. It's a cl essentially a cloud-based system. There are all kinds of in the three major engagement channels are the mobile app, Care Navigator Hub, and the desktop ribbon. And we're going to give you an example of what that is. Three major roles involved in healthcare, and frankly, one of the reasons that we started this in conjunction with, uh, is, uh, with uh, what Neeraj mentioned is we saw even in New Jersey what was happening uh, with social, what the social determinant challenges were in New Jersey. And one thing we were really inspired by, I personally was inspired by, was listening to Jeff Brenner of the Camden Coalition uh, talk about the social determinant problems that we're having in just getting care. And I remember going to an ARC meeting and Atoll Gawande was talking about, he's been tracking this physician in New Jersey. And I said, is that uh, Jeff Brenner, Bonnie Jets? Well, are you going to write an article? Well, I can't tell you yet. But then <laughs> came out with the, his article on hot spotting. It really told us that there are many issues. And it really, you don't need to be in an underserved area to have these social, similar or different social determinants that prevent you from getting the care that you need. So the three roles that we're going to look at today are care coordinators or case management experience that can look at their caseload and individual patients and have dashboards that help them monitor and manage that. The patient and family caregiver to us in many cases, it doesn't matter whether it's children or adults, if they have daughters or sons or family members who help them, most fortunately most adults or patients aren't alone, fortunately, though in some cases Yes, but if there's a family caregiver then that can help them, even if they're at a distance, what can we do to help them? And the physician, what's their clinician experience? They don't want to be overloaded with another new piece of technology, so how do you deal with this issue? Because the first thing we heard is, well, how does it integrate with EMRs? Well, if we're going to wait to integrate with EMRs, that would be a long wait in many cases, though we are doing that in some cases. So how can we be a light touch in terms of integration and still help people? So that's... And the, the, the basic challenge in working this is not wait for people to come to a portal. It's to push messaging out for engagement, whether it's to any part of the, any, any people in the process and the different kind of alerts, and you'll see some examples. So here's the first story. It's the patient-centered medical home and the challenge of interoperability at uh, Children's Specialized Hospital. Um, this was an example that we did at, at HIMSS where we actually showed a, uh, an interoperability study in the New Jersey Delaware Valley HIMSS and these were the people that were involved. Um, a typical case, primary care pediatrician uh, serving the patient, a care navigator involved, critical insurance liaison to make sure they could actually get a referral that could actually be paid for, um, a parent trying to find out what was going on and there are three systems involved. There was an EMR on one side. There was a referral uh, network on the other to see if they could get uh, insurance. And we were connecting them with Care Navigator. So as the smart people at, in New Jersey and Delaware Valley Hymns said, let's lay this out in swim lanes. And that's what they did, because these were the kind of the channels, the pro process that people had to go through, starting with a pediatrician who made a referral. Well, how did that referral happen? Uh, care coordinator went and looked at the what are the insurance possible challenges can we refer them to the right person to make sure that the insurance is paid for are you going to let the patient or the family member know that the patient is going to be taken care of to let the patient know that it's been done and to be able to refer them to a specialist okay that's the swim lanes as they call it but what does it look like for the people involved and the last thing I'll mention in just a several months we had a tenfold increase from patient engagement from where it started, from the, the family caregiver uh, up to 
users engaged or family members engaged in the process. But here's what it looks like. A new referral came out of it, was put into the EMR. It created a, uh, a, a, a re created a referral that came from the EMR into our care navigator system. Tasks were set that were created based upon the messages received from direct output from the EMR. Uh, each task had subtests that the insurance liaison had to complete to make sure they were making the right referral and that it would be paid for. So then Sandy Smith, who, our care coordinator in this case, was able to send a secure text messaging through our app to the patient that Sandy was working on the patient referral and let her know when the task would be completed. Uh, anyone outside the care navigator, for instance, could be working in the hub, but the patient's family caregivers would be using their mobile. And this is a something that's downloaded and accessed, it's all HIPAA compliant. Um, when a referral request is completed, the patient then gets an alert, again, using push technology to let them know. And if, if their app isn't on, they'll still get an alert to say there is information coming that you should take a look at. Then the caregiver or patient can view the appointment in their calendar under the care plan too. So there's a calendar built into the system where they can check and see what aspects of the care plan were involved. So that's just a short version of what happens on the children's side. I will say before we get to uh, the next case that one of the challenges was to make sure that every one of their autism patients was uh, registered in the New Jersey Registry in order to get the services available by county. And uh, just uh, about a month ago, when the person heading up this program asked his staff, okay, how are we doing with the registry? Where are we? They said 100%. And he, could, he just didn't believe it at first because it was 200 patients who were registered in the registry, which usually take them a long time to try to get to any kind of high percentage not 100%. That was a surprise. And that's a result of the work that was done through Care Navigator. Neeraj has your own story to tell. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, well, thanks. So the story number two is about uh, Joe Healy, who is a very unhappy looking patient. But he is a you know, generally healthy patient in the story who's, a, who's had total knee replacement. And uh, it's a, about a post-hospital discharge uh, experience. And how did it the care coordination team in his uh, in this example uh, create a more efficient and effective uh, recovery environment for for Joe. So Joe's been assigned to a care navigator in this case Neil Orant in the upper right hand uh, screen who looks at Joe's information. There's basic demographic information which will come into play uh, in a little bit. And this, that information is entered upon uh, Joe's entry into this in, into the program. Um, now, this, you know, the system knows that Joe is uh, is a, a knee transplant patient, a knee replacement patient, who is uh, so it can automatically generate uh, the post surgical and rehab care plan, which will include you know his clinical as well as non clinical goals, uh, his uh, medications, his rehab plans. And to Mike's point about, you know, we really believe that uh, that you need to create uh, notifications and actionable uh, alerts for for patients to get engaged. And you know, as Eric mentioned earlier, that uh, patient portals are single-digit percentage um, uh, propositions uh, in, in the best case. So Joe gets an alert that there's an assessment here uh, in his Care Navigator mobile app. Now, it's also one thing to point out is that. This assessment is going to be for Joe, and we'll show. But there, there are functional assessments. There are uh, there can be um, medical assessments as well. Um, but assessments can also be, you know, Joe's a, a healthy patient here who has access to a smartphone. But the assessments can also be sent, um, you know, to a caregiver for Joe, um, the, who who may live with Joe, for instance, to help him through it. Um, the the uh, the care navigator. You know, this, this is an assessment about uh, his, uh, his functional abilities. Is he able to take care of himself, essentially? And based on those assessment answers, uh, the organization, in this case, uh, Mercy Healthcare, can create, um, they can create a score. They can create automated workflows, uh, task sets uh, around those questions. So uh, if Joe is um, 
uh, you know, a low literacy or Spanish speaking or whatever it is, they can send it, they can uh, establish uh, rules engines in advance to send them information that's, that's uh, specific to Joe. One of the things that can automatically be established is that because Joe is a, is a knee surgery patient, uh, they know that he's not going to be able to drive for six weeks. So they can, one of the tasks that's for Neil every day uh, as he looks at his patient panel is to say, well, I need to set up uh, transportation for Joe. There needs to be a member of, uh, uh, there needs to be a transportation member on Joe's care team who doesn't need access to you know, all of Joe's uh, uh, medical uh, care plans, but he needs access. To, he needs to know that Joe has an appointment at the rehab center on Friday at three o'clock, and so I need to pick him up at two thirty. I mean, this was one of the critical areas: just getting to the person who knows he should go to the physician, but he can't get there, or she can't get there. What are you going to do? So, if a person says, if a person says, well, they can't get there, or what's their appointment, or what's a problem? We'll ask a question as part of that list to try to ascertain what the problem is and launch a workflow as a result of that. So Tony Transport, you can't really see it here, but Tony Transport has been assigned as, as, the, um, you know, as the transportation service provider here. So anybody can be a part of Joe's care team. It can, and everybody has different permissions. They can be depermissioned if Joe has a fight with, uh, with his daughter and doesn't want her on the, on the care team anymore, and he can depermission her or he can, he can set uh, set limitations on our access. Uh, the care coordinator gets you know, social media-like alerts. This is all internal to the, to the organization and to, um, you know, to, to Joe's care team that uh, certain tasks have been completed. Or if they haven't been completed, they can uh, send reminders. Now, Dr. Andrews here, um, if, you know, if she desires, again, this is you know, not every physician wants this, not every physician wants uh, access, want patients to be able to communicate with them at all times. So this can also be customized, but <laughs> I see a lot of nodding heads in the audience. But uh, and Dr. Andrews can, can exchange text messages with Joe uh, that are all, this is, this is all HIPAA compliant, 256-bit encrypted uh, communications that are stored uh, for reference. Uh, you know, if the, if the swelling was not better, uh, for instance, she could ask Joe to take a picture of that uh, you know, of his knee, send it over to her uh, and say, well, no, you're, this is fine, or Joe, actually, you need to come in here uh, you know, pretty quickly. The, there's secure video chat in, uh, in Care Navigator as well. And you know, to Mike's point earlier, each, um, each caregiver will have a different uh, level of experience that's really customized to that caregiver. So, you know, the care coordinator is doing most of the heavy lifting here. The, you know, the first responders, as we mentioned earlier, uh, and their primary interface is going to be on the hub, um, but they can also access the mobile, uh, mobile and web applications. The physician, uh, you know, this is something that was developed, uh, that, that we developed in conjunction with physicians. This is a desktop ribbon, which, uh, is, as we said earlier, sits on the side of the EMR. It's a, it's a very light. Uh, application that sits on, on a physician's uh, on a physician's last laptop in the sys tray, uh, sort of pops in and up, you know where they they want to have their view of the EMR at all times, but that is you know if they want to understand where does Joe's care plan fit or who are my who are my patients, um, they can bring up Care Navigator, uh, the desktop ribbon, and here we go to story number three. Okay. So our third story is one which we think in some ways ha is the broadest uh, meaning in terms of especially what people are here tonight, uh, accountable care, about accountable care organizations. And it certainly has implications for our accountable community organizations as well. Um, one Care Vermont, which we just started implementing uh, about a month and a half ago, uh, is the largest statewide a ACO, <laughs> one of the largest statewide ACOs. And they actually handle Medicare, Vermont Medicaid, and commercial exchange shared savings programs. The network of providers, while it's part of the University of Vermont Health Network, are not all health network <laughs> providers that are paid by the University of Vermont. It includes most of Vermont's hospitals, two New Hampshire hospitals, hundreds of primary and specialty care physicians, FQHCs, and several rural health care clinics. Their care coordinators, which is our main engine of who's driving this uh, 
software um, are actually uh, are actually employees of different providers. So it's not all managed by the accountable care organization, but they try to set the framework for managing them. And really, they wanted to try to put this on a better framework. They have a wonderful toolkit, which they have posted online, which provides guidance for how, which could be informative for everyone, and provides guidance of their learnings of what, uh, what they've done and how to manage care. But they're trying to get a better view into what's happening and better coordinated. Because there's a huge movement in Vermont not only for, they moved off of the one-payer system, they're now trying to look at an all-payer system that they're working on, but frankly, we went to the Blueprint for Health, not our Blueprint, their Blueprint for Health, uh, last week, and there's certainly a lot of discussion with the social service agencies about how to coordinate all the care, and they're hiring uh, community health workers, too. So how to coordinate all these different pieces, and will that, and that, is certainly in the vision of One Care Vermont to try to expand uh, the, uh, the kind of delivery that they can make. That's the toolkit that I mentioned, which is very informative. And somebody asked me earlier, what's a care coordinator? Well, they actually try to define a care coordinator versus a case manager versus, you know, but it gives some basis for doing that. So really, this is one of the cores of what we're offering because it goes to an enterprise but allows it to go way beyond the enterprise itself. The enterprise is the or originator of the, of the uh, program with us. Here's when members are onboarding. Here's a screen showing a list of all the onboarding requests. So the people that want to be part of the system that uh, One Care Vermont, for instance, has given us and say, these people, we want to put them into the system. There's a process that we can go through unless we all have all the eligibilities and everything in place. There's certain things that we need that the care coordinator will need to look at, make sure they're actually uh, eligible, that they activate them, and to make sure they're in the system. So there's a workflow to make that, to help make that happen. And then somebody can look, well, with a patient alone, who are they looking at? What are they looking at? What's the track record? What are they doing? And we're tracking all the encounters that were that are be happening in there. So they can go and analyze those as well. And when we can see how long a particular patient is spending with a particular, uh, with a particular provider as well. How do they manage this? A care coordinator can look themselves and see how many active patients they have, how has that changed. Uh, a, care, a manager who's managing multiple care coordinators could look and see how are the task assignments going, what's happening with that, and can then drill down into these charts as well and see what's happening, who, where, and when. So it's not just a question of getting a report, they can actually drill down and facilitate change as a result. And there's lots of detailed information that comes out because right, we uh, were just as an example uh, recently in a, in a medical home situation where they were looking to qualify all their medical homes into uh, patient-centered medical homes level three and uh, they were in the process but they realized that with all the care coordinators that they had they really didn't know how much time they're spending with who where and they realized they needed to better manage the system if they were to reach the goals they have and so this enables them to do the kind of reporting and management that they're looking for. So in, you know, just overall, we think that these are, really was informed at the, much at the beginning besides uh, particular stories. What were the social determinant issues? What were the socioeconomic issues, which we know have a huge impact outside of healthcare? And how do you bring that together? But first, in some cases, we have to get part of the healthcare system, whatever system it is, acting better within its unit. So they're all talking together. Um, we think we're on we're on a good path. We've we've we're learning from each of these samples that we have, examples that we have with children specialized, One Care Vermont, and the system we'll be working with shortly, a, a district in New York State, as well as other places that we've learned from. So that's the the short tale. Um, we've actually put together a booklet that describes, uh, that could be a workbook for you that can describe connecting different communities of care, the different kind, which we'll be glad to share with you. It's not a commercial product, it's an informative product and help you work through some of the issues that you might think. And we'd, uh, we're actually uh, 
You can find our website besides at blueprinthit, mycarenav.com, which will be launching as a separate site too, mycarenav.com. But if you have any questions, of course, we'd love to take them now. And I hope I haven't spoken too long at this point. No, no. You know, we have time for about a two or three questions. OK. Great. Yes. I, I congratulate you again on a wonderful product. Wait. <laughs> Thank you. So congratulations again. Uh, Thank you. The uh, thing I'm wondering about, I'm very curious about, and my uh, colleague here also said the same thing, uh, this works if everybody's got a device. So I'm wondering if, if in what you've been experiencing, and maybe particularly the Vermont experience, is anybody thinking, let's get somebody a device if they don't have one so they can now have an advantage of this type of a platform? You know, the, I know, I'll just use, I'm not going to use our experience yet, but I'll use the experience in other, in other cases. And I know this is something that concerns them. But I know, for instance, in New Jersey, sometimes I think they've given out Medicaid phones. But then those phones don't necessarily always continue the process. So there are definitely issues. This is not, I think people underestimate what the role mobile has taken in almost any Everyone, sometimes it's their only method of communication. It may be their only computer. And uh, so you people can underestimate what's there. But Jeff, definitely there are challenges. And I think that uh, I expect that places will be looking for replacements. So even that is not you know, the ultimate answer. So I don't mean it's a challenge and you know, that we'd love to overcome. And it, uh, the also is that there are the possibility of people making phone calls. So there may be a family member, if there's another right. member or care coordinator to reach out to. Because this is not just dependent upon the patient doing it themselves. This right. I was going to help the patient. Sorry, I was going to mention children's specialized hospital, where the patients are children with you know, very severe uh, medically complex needs. They are not the ones primarily who are acting, who are interacting with Care Navigator. It's their parents, it's aunts, uncles, school nurses. You know other members of their care teams. Hey guys, um, another Vermont related question. Um, Vermont is among the most advanced with respect to health information exchange statewide. Um, wondering the extent to which the ACO is playing in that space and the extent to which you guys um, have at least thought about enabling this functionality through that exchange. So like, any, like almost any HIE, it's still a work in progress with tremendous challenges. Um, there certainly uh, where One Care Vermont is very involved with getting information from, the, from, from Vital, um, but it's not, you know, it's not the answer. It's not the answer alone. It's a critical part of it. So this seemed to be the best marriage. They've been through the uh, process uh, previously trying to get this information. At this point, we're working to get certain information will come from the HIE and certain information that will come from their uh, an analytics company that uh, University of Vermont and, uh, and One Care Vermont have hired to help stratify that information and provide that. But there's real, unfortunately, there's no one solution that's going to cover all these areas. But we'll be engaged with them as we can. And certainly One Care Vermont will do as much as they can to take advantage of that. Yes. I have a question. Um, how successful have you been? In a, how successful have you been working with the e EHR systems like Epic and Cerner? Uh, because I know from experience doing development within a hospital system that doctors pretty much only look at Epic and pretty much not much else uh, because they're so busy. So using, I mean, we have integrated with a couple of EHRs at this point. Epic is, uh, is a part of the University of Vermont's medical center system. And we have built uh, the framework for dealing with uh, information from, that we get from it, and also talk to them about putting a link directly on their PRISM site, which is their EHR, Epic site in order to reach into our care navigator. But so we clearly are going to do at least some integration with them. OK. What about single sign-on? Have you guys worked that out yet? There, there is the possibility that in the 
in that epic system right. that there may be. We're, I don't think it's been completely resolved, though it's been thought through about how it could be done. Yeah, and that's one of the reasons for that. Uh, you know that uh, one cares specifically, and UVM specifically asked, you know, for this link outside out of Epic into um, into Care Navigator for that single sign-on capability. But it's being worked through. Uh, it's it really is quite exciting to see what's able to be done now and technologically. The other challenge, however, is how, I'm sure all this information is protected. But it's quite interesting that now all kinds of people are going to be interacting with that individual uh, person's health uh, situation. And it sounds to me like a tremendous hacker's paradise. <laughs> uh, fortunately, uh, one of our challenges or one of the things that helped us is that our company actually started more than 10 years ago as a security consulting firm. So we couldn't do anything without getting through all those hurdles to make sure that ever, whatever we did would be secure and HIPAA compliant. So it would have been much easier to make it without it. But it was really necessary because what our experience was, if you do it afterwards, you're doing it wrong. You have to think about it right from the beginning. And so sh sure, there are challenges, but that's what our security team makes sure that we avoid as much as possible. For University of Vermont, we had to fill out a very complex form describing what the architecture was, what were the security. I mean, it, they put us through the mill and said, hey, we passed their, you know, their concerns. And, but it's not something we can say it's done. It's never done when it comes to security. You know that. Thank you.